Okay, the last talk of this session is going to be presented by Adam Stankovitz. And uh, he and uh, his advisor, Chin Michael Carney, have devised a low cost way to do turn detection, which is going to facilitate video uh, conversations in online courses. So, Adam, all yours. Great. Um, so, in the last two years, our research group has worked on uh, TalkAbout, which is a system that fosters synchronous uh, small group video discussions among learners in massive online classes. Uh, so, to, to date, over 20,000 students have used TalkAbout uh, to participate in discussions with their peers. Uh, however, we don't really know much about what's going on in these conversations. Um, there's no automated way to know how participants are talking with each other or, and uh, whether learners are actually having productive conversations. Um, so in order to understand the group dynamics of these conversations, uh, researchers would need to manually sit in on many discussion groups, uh, but that, due to the scale uh, that talk about is uh, running on, that's not very realistic. Um, so our work, along with prior work, has shown that peer conversations can be an effective approach to learning. Uh, structured activities like uh, talking with peers in small groups enables learners, learners to collaborate with other students at similar levels of understanding. Uh, but adopting structured peer learning activities at scale is challenging. For example, instructors don't have the ability to intervene or facilitate peer interactions in order to help students engage in more productive video conversations. So currently, researchers don't have a method to study these group dynamics, uh, such as dominance, uh, in global video conversations, which causes a lack of understanding uh, for how peer learners communicate in these video discussions. Uh, so to design systems that support more productive conversations, uh, group dynamics are important to consider, as they can impact the effectiveness of a group. Uh, so in his seminal work, Shaw describes group dynamics as the activities, processes, and interrelationships inter that take place in, in social groups. Empirical work shows that these dynamics have a, an effect on the performance and satisfaction of the group. Yet peer learning systems like Talk About are typically unaware of these group dynamics. As a result, systems that facilitate conversations among peer learners at scale should t take into account uh, the conversational and group dynamics to facilitate more productive conversations. So through our paper, we explore two questions. First, we're interested in how we can understand and measure the group dynamics in distributed video, video conversations among learners. And second, using this understanding of group dynamics, uh, we're also interested in what we can learn about structuring video conversations to be more productive for learners. So why video conversations? So video can be a rich communication channel that provides uh, distributed groups with multimodal communication and nonverbal cues. Uh, researcher, research has shown that video conversations improve participants' sense of belonging and willingness to collaborate with their peers. Yet the group dynamics of video conversations are traditionally difficult to study. Analyzing video conversations can be time consuming, especially at scale, and usually involve lots of manual coding of behavior. Uh, so doing so also typically requires the video conversations to be recorded uh, for analysis. Um, so we're interested in how we can understand and measure the group dynamics that take place in these video conversations um, at scale, but we didn't want to capture the video feed of participants or use transcripts of conversations to capture the group dynamics of, the, of these conversations. Uh, this is because we wanted our solution to be non-intrusive uh, for learners should the discussion contain any private or sensitive information. Um, also, participants might not be willing to participate in these discussions if they know that they're um, conversations were being recorded. So given that we're designing for scale, uh, we limited ourselves to using commodity vis video conferencing uh, tools such as Google Hangouts uh, to ensure that our work was accessible to a global community of learners. For this reason, uh, we chose to use low-level data that could be automatically gathered and logged from the Google Hangouts developer API. Uh, specifically, we focused on how we could, how we could detect turn-taking behavior uh, as a first step in understanding the group uh, group dynamics and video conversations uh, with peers. So turn taking, uh, just a quick overview of that, is used to manage the exchange of speaking turns between participants by using signals that dictate when a turn has ended or will continue. So to, to detect turns in video conversations, we can use the fact that participants' primary video feed changes when someone new begins speaking. We can use this to determine the start of a conversational turn and we log when the, that primary video feed changes as reported by the Google Hangouts API. Uh, using these data, we can operation, operationalize a conversational turn to be the block of time from when uh, one participant begins speaking to when a different uh, participant starts talking as well. Um, so to explain how our conversational turn detector works, I'll simulate a conversation with four participants. 
so the turn detector assigns two participants to report uh, speaking turns or when the primary video feed changes. We also are, uh, sorry, uh, we use two reporters in order to have a fallback in case one reporter is unable to report turns due to technical limitations of the video conferencing tool such as bandwidth issues um, or should one of the reporters uh, drop out of the conversation. So having two reporters always ensures that a new speaker will be reported at least once. Uh, the reporting happens automatically by our turn detector behind the scenes, uh, so the participants don't actually know that they've been selected as a reporter. Um, so let's say participant C starts off the conversation by saying hi uh, to the group. When this happens, the two reporters, which are participant A and B right now, um, indicate that the primary video feed changed uh, due to participant C starting to talk. Then uh, participant A responds to participant C. However, because participant A was uh, the reporter at the time, he cannot report himself as the new speaker because the Google Hangouts API does not indicate that the uh, video feed changed when uh, you begin talking yourself. Um, so to get around this, our turn detector assigns a temporary reporter while participant A is uh, speaking, and both of those reporters uh, report that the new participant is now talking. So using this approach, each conversational turn may be reported multiple times due to having these two reporters um, at any given time. Our turn detector then aggregates the multiple reported turns into a single turn for any given participant. So this approach has two limitations. Uh, first, in conversations with only uh, two participants, the primary video feed does not change as you always see the other person that you're talking with. Uh, this means we can't detect turns in dyadic conversations, so only three or more participants in a group. Uh, second, the video feed changes after a short delay when a participant uh, begins speaking, so it's not possible to detect, to detect overlapping turns or back channel. So for example, if someone says uh, yes or mm -hmm, while someone else is talking, we can't detect that. So now that we can uh, detect conversational turns in video conversations, what can we do with knowing participants' turn-taking behavior? Turn-taking might be able to provide an indication for what group dynamics are at play in, in video conversations. So for example, uh, by knowing when and how, how long participants talk, uh, we can abstract the turn-taking behavior into metrics such as dominance. So prior research has shown that dominant behavior directly affects uh, group dynamics. For example, a dominating participant may have a negative effect on a group by limiting the opportunity for others to speak. Um, however, dominance is not always a negative, uh, is not always negative. Dominance has been shown to be a characteristic of a leader or a mediator as well. Um, so detecting dominance in, in video conversations by using turn-taking behavior uh, could play a role in how systems like talk about are designed in order to facilitate more productive conversations. So we consider a conversation to be dominated when there is a large inequality of either the number or duration of turns for individual participants. By focusing on both the number and duration of turns, uh, we can capture two types of dominant behavior uh, where either a participant might speak for the majority of a discussion in very few turns or uh, frequently interrupt others with more short turns or brief turns. So in order to calculate a measure of inequality for each group uh, for dominant behavior, we use a Gini coefficient, which is a non-binary classification of inequality for both the number and duration of turns. Uh, so for our turn detector, uh, for example, the Gini coefficient for the inequality of number of turns is measured between zero, where all group members contributed an equal number of turns, and one where a single group member contributed all of the turns. Um, so to account for both kinds of these dominant behavior, uh, we average those two Gini coefficients into a uh, single metric, or a single domi dominance metric uh, to create a generalized measure of dominance. So now that we have a way of detecting turns and measuring dominance uh, based on turn-taking behavior, uh, we wanted to evaluate how well it worked. So in order to do that, um, we will compare our results uh, in talk about discussion groups uh, to prior research on group dynamics in face-to-face -face conversations. So we applied, our, we applied our term detector and dominance metric to 392 discussion groups in talk about consisting of over 1,000 unique participants. Uh, the conversations, conversations range in size between two and seven participants per group. Uh, there were roughly 530 conversational turns per group, resulting in an average of 62 minutes per discussion group. Most of the de detected turns were short, each discussion group had an average of eight turns per minute, or approximately seven and a half seconds per turn, with a median turn duration of only two seconds. 
So while most detect turns were short, this is not a clear indication that speaking turns were as brief as the data shows here. Uh, Google Hangouts occasionally switches the video feed uh, to a new participant when it detects external background noises. For example, despite no new participant actually starting to speak. So the report, the, 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 yeah, the detected turns are rather impre in, imprecise, uh, but we still get it to yield useful re results. Uh, so in, in addition to the turn taking behavior and dominance metric, we also uh, collect qual qualitative feedback from participants regarding their experience in the discussion group in a post conversation survey. Uh, so we asked uh, these several questions such as these, uh, like if they felt they contributed something to the group, learned something from the discussion, and would want to meet again with the same group members. We also asked participants to share specific experiences about being in the discussion group. Um, so in the open text responses, several participants noted that participating in the larger group, in larger groups, led to more dominant group behavior in which one or more participants uh, dominated the conversation. So prior research has found that as the size of face-to-face uh, -face groups increase, uh, the likelihood of the group being dominated by one or more participants also increases. Uh, this may be because there's more social pressure or, or factors like uh, social loafing might be taking place. Um, so we're, we were interested to see if this held true for our talk about discussion groups, um, and we can see it, that it does. Uh, by correlating our dominance metric with the number of participants in each group, uh, we see a similar trend in which larger groups exhibited more dominant behavior. So this suggests that our dominance metric corresponded to students' subjective experience in the, in the discussion groups and existing research on dominant behavior in face-to-face -face converse conversations. So prior work by Anita Woolley has shown that dominance is perceived to increase with a larger fraction or proportion of uh, male participants in co-located or face-to-face -face discussion groups. So we were curious if this uh, gender com composition in video conversations and talk about had a similar effect. Um, we do find a similar trend in talk about discussion groups. Uh, so we split the groups into majority male and majority female groups and compared them based on our dominance metric. Uh, so we found that majority male groups uh, demonstrated significantly more dominant behavior than majority female groups. So. Uh, Prior research, prior research has shown that giving feedback to participants about their group's conversational dynamics in face-to-face -face conversations can lead to participants uh, changing their behavior, resulting in higher performing and more satisfied groups. So given these results, we're, we were interested to see if, or to know if uh, turn detection might uh, yield useful implications uh, for how students learn from talking with their peers and how peer learning systems like talk about for video conversations could be better designed. So we found that self-perceived learning increased for learners who contributed longer duration turns to the conversations. Additionally, we found that self-perceived learning increased as other group members talked more. Uh, so this suggests that learners felt they learned more not only through speaking and sharing knowledge and personal experiences, uh, but through other participants speaking as well. So knowing this, uh, systems like TalkAbout could be designed to encourage learners to speak up or speak longer and uh, listen to others more closely. Uh, we also find a significant relationship between uh, students who talk longer in their final course grade. Uh, this relationship suggests that learners who actively contributed to talk about discussion groups uh, also perform more highly in the course. Uh, however, we only had grade data for one course in our sample of participants, so we'd need to uh, see if this holds true in other courses as well. Additionally, we found that learners who were in groups where group members talked uh, longer would be more likely to want to meet uh, with the same group members again. Uh, so that's like a satisfaction type of metric. Uh, so this suggests that more active and engaged group members might result in higher satisf satisfaction given that group members talked more. So building on these results, uh, systems like Talk About might try to encourage a larger number um, of learners in the group to contribute to the conversation to make it more uh, active and engaged. So uh, through this paper, uh, we developed a simple, accessible, and scalable method for uh, conversational uh, turn detection. Uh, then we applied the detected turns to create a metric for dominance. We validated our turn detection approach in dominance metric by comparing our results with prior research in face-to-face -face conversations. So now we're interested in using our validated conversational turn detector in dominance metric in order to structure or scaffold uh, these video conversations, similar to what researchers have done for text-based and face-to-face -face conversations, but not so much in video conversations. So for example, Kim et al. showed that providing co-located or face-to-face -face group members 
with real-time feedback on uh, the group's dominant behavior uh, led to more equal participation among peers. Also, researchers have explored uh, providing dynamic conversation support to produce higher quality uh, text-based peer interactions. So for example, Kumar et al. found that di dynamic conversation support yielded similar learning gains to intelligent tutoring. However, these systems pertain only to text-based and face-to-face -face conversations and may not be as effective in richer communication channels such as video, but currently without a way to um, detect these group dynamics at scale in video conversations, we don't really know. Uh, so our turn detector and dominance metric may be a way to provide systems like talk about with an automatic snapshot of a group's conversational dynamics in order to achieve similar results. So by abstracting low-level features such as turn-taking behavior into metrics uh, like dominance, it might be possible for systems like talk about to provide more active conversation support in real time based on participants' turn-taking behavior. For example, uh, perhaps a system could provide uh, interventions for participants who are dominating a conversation to remind them to let others to speak or to encourage participants who have not contributed in anything to the conversation to actually speak up. Um, additionally, by creating models of how participants interact in video conversations based on their turn-taking behavior, uh, systems could use that as input for selecting discussion partners. Uh, for example, if you know a participant has not talked much in previous discussions in talk about, uh, the system could place them into a group where other participants are more talkative so that they have the benefits of being in, in a more active, engaged group. Uh, so that's the talk. Uh, <laughs> we'll be releasing the code for the con conversational turn detector and dominance metric. If you're interested, you'll find a link that is in the paper. Uh, thanks, and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, we uh, definitely have time for questions, so we'll start with John. And as a reminder, please use the mic when you answer. I think there's a fair amount of study of how uh, groups interact, especially in problem-solving situations. Often there's somebody who uh, helps keep the group on task and somebody else who facilitates. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to see some kind of patterns like that, that somebody who tries to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak might speak in some uh, you know, predictable sort of pattern. Did you look at anything like that? So I personally did not, but uh, in the talk about paper that was presented at Learning at Scale last year, I believe, uh, with my advisor, Chinmay, uh, they did have a experimental condition where uh, they had a randomly selected moderator that was supposed to uh, kind of moderate the conversation. But I, from what I remember in those, in those results, it didn't actually work out very well. Yes. Yes, we would be able to. We would be able to de detect that, yeah, in real time. Hi. Um, uh, so, first of all, very, very clever. Um, your your strategy for doing the the, the turn detection. Um, I guess uh, I I, I kind of have two questions, and I wonder if I can just squeeze them both in. One of them is, um, <clears throat> uh, it seems to me that um, doing the turn detection um, might be simpler in a different framework where you would have um, easier access to the speech than you get from a uh, Google Hangout um, setup. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much of the work was really very, uh, just needed to be specific to that and you know, another possibility might be build a new platform and I wonder why you chose to go this way. Um, but my second question, I, I'll just squeeze both questions in at once, is that um, the recommendations that you um, presented seem very reasonable, but the R squares were so tiny, and I wonder um, um, what you think the the implication of that is. So, so um, is 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 an R square of 0.01 or 0.02 enough to base a design um, uh, implication on? And do you think that um, the re, you know I guess how do you account for it? Do you think there was something else going on that was maybe bigger than these patterns? So I, I guess I'll address your first question first. Um, so the reason why we chose Google Hangouts uh, is because it's a commodity video conferencing system, so lots of people have access to it. Um, whereas if we were using something that is able to detect uh, speech or actually have access to the video feeds, um, that's, that's not as scalable. Uh, so like, there's people from all sorts of different countries that don't necessarily have access to those specialized types of video conferencing tools. Uh, so that's why we stuck with commodity video conferencing tools. And then 
to the second question, yes, they are low R squared values, um, but I think it's more of a, a glimpse into what might be possible. Uh, there's a, a lot of noise in the turn detection uh, data because it is so imprecise, um, but I think it's still useful results. Uh, so we had one over here, and then Joseph, and then, okay. Hi, uh, Chase Geigel, UAUC. I think we've forgotten to do that. Um, so I guess two, two questions. One's fairly quick, um, just kind of following up on that. So we know that the, the turn detection is rather noisy. Do you have a sense of how noisy, and do you have any um, plans or, or, or ideas on how you might combat that noise? Because I feel like if I have a cold, maybe I become the dominant person in the conversation because I'm <laughs> coughing, right? Right. Um, yeah, we haven't thought much about like how we can make it not as imprecise. Okay. Um, maybe if there's like a lot of really short like bursts of turn because of the like background noises or something, we could like kind of silence that for a temporary moment of time. There's probably ways to make it less or more precise. Right. I wonder if there's like a certain, you know, duration or something that we right, expect. Right. Um, the other question was um, there were two there were two things in the um, reporting that, I, that seemed to that they seemed like to kind of contradict each other almost. It was like the self-reported learning was higher if the person spoke longer, but it was also higher if they listened more, but those kind of seem in tension with one another. Um, what do you think, like why is that, and or, or, and or do you think the self-reported learning correlates with actual learning? Yeah, so I don't have any data on uh, whether or not the self, or the perceived learning correlates with the actual learning. Um, but the, the weird contradiction, I think it makes sense because uh, if you're talking more, you're participating, you're being active, uh, so active learning versus passive learning, um, you would be contributing more to the conversation. Um, as for listening to others, uh, participants in talk about, like, it's a global conversation, so you have people from, I think there was in, in this sample an average of uh, four countries in each discussion group, so by talking with other people about uh, those types of things, you get a diverse background. Um, diverse experiences, things like that. So both have, have value. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, e either that or the people who talk a lot are, are cheating and harvesting answers. But assuming that's not happening. <laughs> oh, yeah, I really like Karen's questions, but I'm actually a bit on your side in the sense of using something like Google Hangouts is super scalable. Like every, if you could do it for Google Hangouts, you kind of did it for almost everything because so many people use it. But also they've got really good APIs and stuff. I think that was a great, great engineering decision. Um, on the second issue, Carolyn is really catching things about those R squared being small. One thing I wonder is, could you phrase your prompts in a way that it's okay if you're wrong? So for example, instead of saying you're talking too much, you say something more like, might you be talking more than average? Even if I'm not talking that much, maybe it's actually not too bad to get that question because it's a prompt to reflect. So some kind of psychologically designed things like that might actually be really effective. And I think just if they believe that you've got some way of maybe monitoring, then you can start to do, get away with these kinds of interventions. I mean, you might even be able to get away with them right now, even without your system, but I wonder if there'd be a way to get good effective behavior by designing prompts just right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, part, part of the research on um, the face to face conversations like they use visualizations to show like the relative proportion of speaking versus other participants uh, in that showed to be um, uh, a good method of making more equal conversation uh, but again like some like dominant do dominance isn't always a bad thing so we don't always have to encourage more equal participation if the dominant person is actually good at like mediating or facilitating the conversation Amy from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I wanted to follow up on Carolyn's question because, uh, you know, the R value is Im important. I was wondering if you think that it's a actually maybe not a linear model. Do you think that there's some point at which everybody's talking too much and, and you get annoyed? Um, there's some sweet spot maybe. Uh, and Continuing there, I was wondering if there's a chance that um, dropouts affect, I don't, I, I don't think you said uh, how you accounted for that, like people who are leaving, do they still take the survey, do, uh, does their data not get included here, do people, maybe you have a sense qualitatively, do people drop out of these conversations if they're not enjoying them? Um, so 
in the data set that I have for like all the data set I had for the turn taking, it was just the, the turns. There was no indication of uh, what people were originally in the conversation versus not a afterwards. Like the assumption, I guess, would be like if you see someone doing a lot of turns in the beginning and then they don't anymore, like you don't know if they dropped out or um, just stopped talking. Uh, and then based on the uh, question about like the temporal aspect of it, uh, just looking at the um, like second by second kind of like turn durations, uh, it seems like about a third or halfway through the conversation, it does kind of like spike up a little bit. So I don't know why that is, but it's interesting to possibly explore in the future. Hi, um, oh, uh, uh, Sam Joseph from uh, Hawaii Pacific University. Um, I'm particularly interested in what you're doing with the Google Hangout plugin. Mm -hmm. We also use a Google Hangout plugin for our, our work with um, the edX 169 MOOC. Um, the students we have, they tend to fix the uh, video view on a single screen because they're doing pair programming. So there's a lot of talking going on, but they, you know, tend to like just want to be looking at one uh, vi video screen. And so I, I sort of assume the technique probably wouldn't work there. You're relying upon the Google Hangout being left in that mode where it automatically flips based on the audio. Um, you didn't have any trouble with people setting it to be stuck on one. I guess for your format, they always wanted it to be. Right, right. So the default setting is for it to switch, always switch. Um, I, I don't know if we have any data on if they change that default setting. But I mean, I, the particularly interesting thing for me is, and I guess the answer is probably no, it sounds like that, that was the only way you, you could discover mm -hmm. to like detect a participant uh, right. thing. And so yeah. for, for so us, if they're the, using that yeah. lock, we, we're stuck, really. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right, thanks. <laughs> So it, it sounds like, uh, although you haven't measured its R-squared, there is a design guideline in here for people designing video conferencing systems. Mm -hmm. I provide this kind of instrumentation readily. Uh, any other questions before we thank Adam? Thank you very much. Thank you.